Last class period, we talked about the photoelectric effect. What was special about the photoelectric effect? It was something that said that light had a particle nature. Previously, for instance, in our last exam, we talked about the wave nature of light. So now we have to come to grips with what's going on. And so we talk about a wave particle duality. A duality, it has both natures. Because remember, Young's experiment showed it couldn't be a particle. But Einstein's experiment showed it couldn't be a wave. So we have to have some kind of compromise. And that's what the wave particle duality is. So let's just review what things tell us that light has a wave nature. Refraction, bending around corners. Or not around corners. Bending when it goes from one medium to another. Diffraction, that's bending around corners. Interference, that's when you have waves that are in phase giving you constructive interference or when they're out of phase giving you destructive interference. And then polarization, that's where you're talking about having a transverse electric or magnetic field. All of those could only occur with a wave. But now we saw from Einstein's photoelectric effect something that could only occur with a particle. And we're going to look at a few more options of particle ideas here. So getting into it, what are x-rays? You go to the dentist. She does an x-ray of your teeth. What are they doing? Well, x-rays, it turns out, are high energy photons. Now remember from last lecture, the energy of a photon is Planck's constant times its frequency. So high energy means high frequency. So x-rays have a high frequency. And they're photons, that means they're particles of light. So there could be other particles like actual BBs. That's not them. How do we produce them? Your, your dentist has something like this. There is a voltage source here that is a low voltage. In fact, usually it's just something like around, let's say, 7 volts AC. I know this shows it as a DC, but it's about 7 volts AC usually. And it's just kicking off electrons. But then you have a high voltage supply here. So in this picture, they showed a single cell for low voltage, and they showed four cells for high voltage. It's high voltage so that you have these little electrons that are cooked off of that filament. And then if this side here is very positive compared to this side, so notice this is the positive side, the negative side, then there is a, an electric field that makes them come across. So you're going to have the work is equal to Q delta V. And so they're going to have a work is changing kinetic energy. So they leave with the kinetic energy zero. They arrive here with kinetic energy that's equal to at the target equals the charge of the electron multiplied by the voltage difference. So they have a pretty high kinetic energy. You might wonder, well, what about the kinetic energy they had before they started? They start with a very low energy. I mean, if it's 7 volts AC, they're going to have you know, no less than or no more than, let's say, 10 electron volts. And if you put 20,000 volts here, that's, that's in the noise. So you have these very high energy electrons that hit your metal target. And when they hit the metal target, out comes light. Now, this should look somewhat familiar. This is exactly the reverse of the photoelectric effect. Photoelectric effect, you sent photons in and you got electrons out. Here we're sending electrons in and we get photons out. So the question is, you know, why, why would this even be listed as something that has to do with the particle nature of light? I mean, I don't see any particle light. I see particles of electrons. So let's learn a little about x-rays. First, what is making the x-rays? We have an electron that comes and hits the metal. 
And when it hits the metal, it's going to be slowed down. That's an acceleration. And anytime you have a charged particle accelerate, it gives off radiation. And so in this case, because it's slowing down, we call it bremsstrahlung, or that's German for breaking radiation, breaking as in slowing down. And so you have a lot of x-rays that are emitted because you're slowing down the, the electron. Well, so far, this doesn't really say anything about a particle nature of light now, does it? So here's where we start to see something with the particle nature of light. If I have 30 kilovolts is the energy that I am, the voltage difference between the electron gun and my target, then that means my kinetic energy is equal to 30 kilovolts times the charge of an electron is equal to 30 kilo electron volts. That's why we use the electron volt, right? Don't have to do much thinking. So if my kinetic energy is 30 kilo electron volts, then how much energy can I give to a photon, to a particle of light? Well, I could give all of this 30 kilo electron volts. So that gives me a cutoff frequency, frequency cutoff is equal to that 30 kilo electron volts divided by Planck's constant. And so if you look at the actual, what you get as a function of energy, you have a cutoff here for the energy or a cutoff, if you will, for the wavelength is what they have in the lower axis that matches the photon energy of your electron beam. So this says that you are converting the energy of an electron into a photon, the maximum energy that you can convert into is if all of the energy goes into one photon. You could have it slow down and create one photon here and then it still has a lot of energy left and creates another photon you know, somewhere else. So that adds up to, obviously, with my example there, that's only about four, so it'd have to be here to make a second photon. Or you could have, you know, it creates 115, creates 110, we're only down 25, and we still got five to go, creates one five. So you could have had three photons there that would have also sufficed. But you can't have any photons with an energy, that wasn't supposed to happen. You can't have any photons with an energy higher than the, mat, than the energy of an electron hitting your surface. So this first picture is a picture of what the X-ray spectrum looks like with a linear energy scale. So that's energy on this axis. This one here is also a linear energy scale. We'll see on the coming pages some other ways of writing the X-rays. So this smooth thing here That's the Bremsstrahlung. I'm just going to go back to make sure I spell it right. SS. That's the Bremsstrahlung radiation. And that example that was shown here is with a silver target. This Bremsstrahlung is going to look pretty much the same regardless of the target, but these things here. We call those the characteristic peaks. And that's, that's a different thing, something we have to learn about. If you look over here, it called this the K characteristic radiation. That's these two are Ks. Hmm, what are those? Ls. Um, so let, let's, let's go through and learn what those are. So we've already talked about the cutoff frequency. You've already seen this equation. The frequency max times H is equal to the kinetic energy of your electrons that are hitting the surface. So let's do a problem and then get back to it. So we have a potential energy difference of 87 kilovolts is applied between the filament and the target. So I have here's my filament. Here's my target. And I have... 87 kilovolts there. 
So electrons come off of here and hit with a kinetic energy equals 87.0 kilo electron volts. And they will produce photons then with energy HF. So now reading the problem completely so I don't answer the wrong thing. So we have 87 kilovolts applied between the film and the target. Use the local clinic to look for broken bones. What are the shortest wavelength x-rays produced by this tube? Shortest wavelength corresponds to highest frequency. And the highest frequency is going to be when I have HF equals kinetic energy. So frequency is equal to kinetic energy over H. So in this case, that's 87.0 kilo electron volts. Then I need to divide by H. Now we saw from yesterday's lecture that H is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. But that's only one set of units. It's not the only set of units you have to use. So you could also use the Planck's constant is 4.1357 times 10 to the minus 15 electron volts times seconds. Well, since I have kinetic energy and electron volts, I'm going to use that one. 4.1357 times 10 to the minus 15 electron volts times seconds. So that's going to give me a number. Remember, K means thousands. This is 87,000. That's 8.70 times 10 to the 4. EV over 4.1357 times 10 to the minus 15 EV times seconds. So that would be equal to, and I know it's roughly two, but I'm actually going to calculate it. Equals 2.103. Six times 10 to the, and notice that's four minus negative 15 times 10 to the 19th. And then one over seconds or hertz. That's the frequency. It asks for the wavelength. Wavelength is equal to speed of light over the frequency equals 2997924588 meters per second divided by 2.1036 times 10 to the 19th hertz, since 1 over seconds is hertz. And so if I do that, I will have 7 7.0. 1, 7 times 10 to the minus, and now this would be 8 minus 19 is minus 11 meters equals 7.17 and see micro nano pico pico meters. Hope I did that all right. So that's the wavelength that would be produced by this. That's a very, very short wavelength. I, uh, yeah. I hope I did it right. I, I did some of the calculations in my head, some of them calculated. It seems kind of short, but I'm just going to go with it. Now, for those characteristic peaks, those characteristic peaks are another thing that helps us to understand the particle nature of light. So as you probably have already learned in chemistry class, if you have, let's just take a simple atom like a hydrogen atom. Okay, so th it, these are clearly not hydrogen atoms, you know, silver, tungsten, whatever. But you have energy equals minus 13.6 electron volts. And then the next one is going to be that divided by four. So, and I should have these memorized.
And so that's 3.4. And then the next one is going to be divided by 9, 1.51, and so on until you get up to E infinity equals 0. So you have this structure of electron energy levels. And the ground state is down here. If I excite an electron up to here, it can fall down and give off a photon with energy HF is equal to the energy difference between the starting and ending points. Or it could alternatively have gone up to or have fallen down to here where I would have had E equals HF equals E3 minus E2. So here I have an example of two different decays. Um, another decay that could have been possible is it could have gone from here to here and give off So there's, what I've drawn here is three different potential energies I could have for an electron falling down to the ground state. And that's what the characteristic peaks are. So as we name them, notice I had two here that ended at E1. If they end at E1, then we call them a K because they ended in the K shell, if you know anything about the, the shells of electrons. And then this one here had a difference, delta N equals 1, and we call that alpha. So K alpha means that it goes from N equals 2 to N equals 1. So the difference is 1 is what alpha tells us, and N final equals 1 is what K tells us. So what would it be going from 3 to 1? Well, then delta N is 2, and we just go to the second letter of the Greek alphabet. So this one here would have been a K beta. K because it ends with N equals 1. Beta because the difference in N went from 3 to 1. It was 2. So as a final thing, what would this one be? Going from E3 to E2. Well, it ended at 2, and so the shells after K comes L, so that's an L shell. And then it's a difference of going from 3 to 2, a difference delta N of 1, so that's an L alpha. So if we look at these, remember this is energy increasing this way if we have the frequency. So this is the highest energy that's being produced. So this is probably the L beta, or not L beta, the K beta. The Ks, because you have the biggest drop getting to the lowest, are the highest energy. So that would be K beta, and this little fellow here would be the K alpha. And then this would be L beta and L alpha. So those are the characteristic peaks that are caused by electrons falling from one energy level to another and giving off a photon, a particle of light, with energy equal to the difference in the energy levels. So those characteristic peaks over here, called it line spectrum, are telling us about the energy levels of the target. So a different target is going to have different characteristic peaks. And those are not the energies of the electrons now. That's an electron in a core electron in the atom has to have gotten knocked up to a higher energy level, and then something falls in to fill that core electron. That's what's going on with these characteristic peaks. Now, here is a very useful equation to know. We have the electromagnetic spectrum. Very short wavelengths are out here, very long wavelengths over here. Radio waves are long wavelengths, AM radio, FM radio, television, microwaves. So here's what we cook our food with, <laughs> cook our food in this region here. We also talk on our cell phones in that region. Our cell phones use microwaves to communicate. We're not worried about it because the, the 
energy of a single photon is not enough to ionize, is not enough to break a bond, and the power is not enough to cook things, despite what you might have seen on the internet of people popping phones their cell phones. That is bogus. It's not real. Okay, so we have radio waves, then microwaves, then infrared, visible light, and then we have this. Now, this breaks it down, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. Ultraviolet, technically, ultraviolet just is this whole range. All of this is above violet. So what's x-rays? X-rays is electrons falling to core energy states. That's the characteristic x-rays. So if it's called x-rays, it's because it was produced this way. Gamma rays are coming from the nucleus. We haven't studied that yet. So the difference in x-rays, gamma rays, and ultraviolet is fundamentally the source of the light. But we are producing, you know, the, the example we did, um, we had a frequency of 10 to the 19th hertz. So 10 to the 19th hertz on this picture would be here. And looking at their numbers here, that'd be somewhere around 3 to the minus 11, which I think is where we came in. Oh, yes. The thing that was very useful to you. Energy of a photon is HF. But F frequency is C over lambda. And so we have on the top... Planck's constant times C. Well, we can write Planck's constant times C in all kinds of units. And here's one that's really useful. 1240 nanometers times electron volts. So when I was in graduate school, I was doing research and I was using a 248 nanometer laser. So I had wavelength is 248 nanometers. That's an ultraviolet laser. And so the energy for a photon was equal to HC over lambda, or 1240 nanometers times electron volts, divided by the wavelength, 248 nanometers. Now, in this calculation, my nanometers cancel. And 1240 is 5 times 248. And so it was 5 electron volts. I don't know why that looks like a capital E. Electron volts. So I was using a 5 electron volt, 5.0 electron volt laser. 5 electron volts or 248 nanometers, that is enough to break bonds. So that's something that could, you know, when absorbed by your skin, it could cause mutations and cause skin cancer. Um, I hate to say it, but I would come home with, with sunburns and these little rectangular patterns all over my arms from reflected light. That couldn't have been good for my future. All right, a couple questions to make sure you can pay attention. What causes these characteristic peaks? Our options are bound electrons falling to lower energy states, or electrons slowing down, or electrons speeding up, or light being absorbed by electrons. Now let's analyze these. Electrons falling to lower states, that is exactly the case. We're falling down to a core energy state. Core meaning n equals one or two. Electrons slowing down. We had a name for electrons slowing, slowing down. That was that Bremsstrom. Electrons speeding up. Well, that is not part of what we've been dealing with. Light being absorbed by electrons. No, that was what we call the photoelectric effect. Okay, second test. Which statement is true about wave theory? A frequency of a wave cannot change. Frequency. If I have two strings tied together, And I have a wave that comes here, the frequency one and the frequency two have to be the same or else this knot's gonna break. So the frequency of a wave cannot change. 
Well, we found a right answer. What about the wavelength? Well, remember, if the frequency changes and we have frequency times wavelength is equal to speed, I better put V because this is speed and whatever the medium is, then if frequency stays the same, if the speed increases, the wavelength has to increase. If the speed decreases, the wavelength has to decrease. So the wavelength can change. How about the energy of a photon? Well, photons are not part of wave theory. So this one here is a nonsense answer because photons are not a part of wave theory. If they were, the energy of a photon is HF, and we would say, well, frequency can't change, so the energy can't change. So even if it wasn't nonsense, it would still be something that would apply. The momentum of a photon cannot change. Once again, photons are not a wave theory thing. But if they were, momentum is hc over wavelength. Um, excuse me, h over wavelength. And so since the wavelength changes, the momentum would change but it's not part of wave theory. So there you have it. Frequency of the wave cannot change. Now we come to Arthur Holly Compton. In 1922, now I should mention, 1905 is what is generally considered the start of modern physics. What makes it modern is that it turned the world on its head. Physicists around 1900 thought they had all of physics figured out. They knew how everything worked. And many of them went on record talking about how, you know, you've got this all figured out. And then 1905 with Einstein's three papers, the entire world of physics got thrown upside down. And so everything after 1905, all of those new discoveries is what we call modern physics. So in 1922, Arthur Holly Compton noticed that when x-rays of a single wavelength hit matter, some of the radiation was scattered in various directions. That is, he had... If we look at our picture here, here's his source. And so he's sending particles this way. Some go straight. Some goes off at an angle. So they go off at different angles. But what he noticed that was really startling was with the stuff that changed direction, you had most of it was at the same wavelength that it started with. But then you had some that shifted to having a new wavelength. And that new wavelength shifted more and more as you had a bigger and bigger scattering angle. And so the uh, should be shifting to a longer wavelength. I showed shift to lower, so I was showing the wrong one for the shift. It's shifting this way. This is the lambda prime. So this doesn't make sense because, of course, I, you say it's measuring wavelength. And if we go back here, we said, oh, well, the frequency cannot change, but the wavelength can for wave theory. But here's the thing. He's measuring it in air. The wavelength is equal to the wavelength in vacuum divided by the index refraction. So since this wavelength was always measured in air, it should have the same wavelength everywhere. The frequency has changed. can't happen for a wave, violates wave theory. So the fact that this scattering caused a change in wavelength, a change in frequency, means that it had to be a particle physics thing. It had to be a photon with energy HF hit, and then when it scattered, it lost some energy. So the frequency dropped or the wavelength got larger for the scattered light. So how do you explain this? Well, you can't explain it as a wave. You just can't. So <laughs> this is just going to now particle physics. In particle physics, what can change? So the frequency, the frequency, this says cannot, but it can change. Frequency can change because you'd just be changing the energy of the photon. You'd be taking energy away. The wavelength, of course, the wavelength can change. It can happen in wave theory too. The energy of a photon, if you take away its energy, it can change. The momentum of a photon changes wavelength. Yeah, none of those are correct statements. All of those things can happen. So it's acceptable in particle physics to see this. So what 
what Compton figured was, okay, we must have our photon hitting something. I mean, it can't scatter without interacting with something, right? So suppose it hits an electron. Photons carry a momentum. The momentum of a photon is Planck's constant over its wavelength. And they carry energy. The energy of the photon is hf or hc over wavelength. Or in other words, momentum times the speed of light. So it carries momentum and energy. And then when it hits this electron, it's going to transfer some energy and momentum to the electron. And our physics says that we must have, because this is isolated, energy conserved. And the energy conserved. So here we had energy was HC over lambda. Here it's HC over lambda prime. And then here we're going to have some kinetic energy of the electron. So we're going to have to have HC over lambda. Initial energy is equal to HC over lambda prime plus the kinetic energy of the electron. So that's our conservation of energy equation. Oh my goodness, I put energy twice there. One was energy, one was momentum. And then for momentum, well, we're going to have to conserve momentum in both the vertical and, well, in the two dimensions here. So X and Y, we're going to have to have momentum X is conserved and momentum Y is conserved. So that's going to give us two more equations. Now, we're not going to go through and do the calculations, especially because you have to use relativity in doing these calculations. So here's the one equation that we just looked at for conservation of energy. And then if we go through and we do the calculation for conservation of momentum, i skipping over stuff here. I've already said momentum of photon is Planck's constant over lambda. So when you do that conservation of momentum, I'm going to get there. You have the two conservation of momentum equations, one for the x direction. So this is the x original direction it was traveling, we call the x direction. And then we have the momentum of the electron, cosine phi, plus the momentum of the new photon, cosine theta, where phi is the angle that the electron was scattered, theta is the angle that the light was scattered. That's the X component, the Y component, we have sines, and it had zero in the Y component direction initially, minus momentum of electron sine phi plus the new momentum of the photon sine theta. And putting all those together, Compton came up with this equation. The shift in wavelength, that is lambda prime minus lambda, is equal to Planck's constant over mass of electron C times one minus cosine theta, where theta is the scattering angle. In other words, if the light was initially going this way and then it came out this way, that's the scattering angle theta. You might ask, why is that mass of an electron? The reason it's mass of an electron is because the light is scattering off an electron. The obvious follow-up question is, why does it scatter off an electron? Why doesn't it, for instance, scatter off a proton? If you used, um, let's say, something that it has a lot of hydrogen atoms, why couldn't you have... Compton scattering off of protons, the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. And the answer is you could. You could. But how big is this? If we're doing the mass of an electron, and we calculate what that is, H over mass of electron C is 2.426 times 10 to the minus third nanometers, or 2.426 picometers. That's a very small wavelength for what we call the Compton wavelength. So the amount of shift you're going to see, 2.4 was it 2.6 picometers. The biggest shift you could have is when cosine theta is minus 1. So 1 minus a negative 1, this has a maximum value of 2. So the biggest shift you can see if you scatter off an electron is two times the Compton wavelength, or 4.85 T 
two picometers. Really short wavelength for the difference. So you can see why it wasn't until 1922 that anyone noticed this shift because it's really tiny. Well, what if you were scattering off of a proton? A proton is, uh, is much more massive than an electron. And because it's much more massive, the h over mass of a proton c would be a few orders of magnitude smaller value. It's still in our pretty much non-measurable range for the Compton shift you could get from scattering alpha protons. I understand it has been measured, but it's going to take very, very specialized equipment to measure that. So Compton shift, you have a shift in wavelength that depends on what angle it was scattered. And it's calculated by using conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. So let's just look at a problem here. An X-ray photon of wavelength 10 picometers is scattered through 110 degrees by an electron. What's the kinetic energy of the recoiling electron? So we had energy initial is equal to HC over lambda initial. And energy prime for the photon is HC over lambda prime. And then we have kinetic energy of the photon is what, or not the photon, of the electron is what I'm looking for. Well, how do we find this? First, I need to find what lambda prime is. So, or lambda, I put a subscript one instead of a prime. There's my equation. So lambda prime minus 10.0 picometers equals 2.426 picometers times 1 minus cosine of 110 degrees. So that's not such a hard calculation, <laughs> says who. So let's just do it. Let's do it. So I have... 2.426 picometers times 1 minus cosine of 110 degrees. Okay, so I only had three sig figs in this answer. I put a fourth one just so I wouldn't drop any important information. So that's my new lambda prime. So E0 equals E prime plus kinetic energy of the electron. Therefore, kinetic energy of the electron is equal to E0 minus E prime equals HC over HC lambda prime. Give myself some space here. Equals 1240 nanometers times electron volts over 10. Let's just put 0 0.0100 0 nanometers minus 1240 nanometers times electron volt over 0 0.0148. Five nanometers. And so now I can do this. Maybe one divided by point zero one minus one divided by point zero one four eight. One four eight, yeah, that's right. Um, one four eight five nine six.
So that gives me a right on this side. So 40.6 kilo electron volts. So that's that's put a lot of energy on it. I, I don't feel very good about that calculation, honestly, but but that's what I got. Everyone should check my calculations. All right. So now we've gone through Compton scattering. Previously, we've talked about some of these other things. Which phenomena, multiple answers now because that's plural, support a particle theory of light? Compton scattering, what we just did, they had to use a particle nature for it to change frequency, so that definitely supports a particle theory. Rayleigh scattering is the scattering of light off of particles that are smaller than the wavelength of light. It's why the sky is blue. And it works just fine with the wave theory. For electric effect, that's the first one we talked about that is a particle nature. Young's double slit, no, that is most clearly only a wave. And then x-ray production, yep, that's particle theory. So here we have three things we talked about that support a particle theory of light. So I started the lecture, we're going to talk about a wave particle duality. Now I've laid, laid out why we believe that light behaves as a, a particle as well as a wave. So other experiments you can do. Wave nature, diffraction, and interference. Particle nature, electric effect. What happens if you have individual photons? So if you have a light source that's producing verifiable individual photons, and then you have that hit a, a diffraction or a double slit. So photons are particles. So I have a particle that's coming like this. Will it then go through and make a bright spot here and a bright spot here and just have two bright spots? Or will it build a diffraction pattern? I mean, it's the kind of question that you just have to test. It's the only reasonable way to find an answer. And so scientists have done that, shooting photons one at a time. And so when they do them one at a time, the first one might hit a screen and the first one might hit here, and the second one hits here, and the third one hits here, and the fourth one hits here. And over time, it builds up a diffraction pattern. But since it was one photon at a time, you know, diffraction means you have a wave interfering. So what actually happens, our best understanding of what happens when I fire a single photon, it was a photon, it was a particle when it was made. But when it gets to the slit, it's going to be a wave, and part of the photon goes through here, and part of the photon goes through here. And then the wave nature, those interact with each other, and so you have constructive and destructive interference, and probabilistically, when it hits the screen, the screen is detecting a photon, and you just have a dot for that one photon. And then if you add up over time the accumulation of thousands of these photons interfering with themselves, you build up the diffraction pattern. So what this illustrates is the particle nature and the wave nature both coexist. Now, the way I always think about this is that that really trite lane thing about four blind men who walk up and they feel this thing. It's an animal. And one person says, oh, it's like a snake. The other one says, oh, it's like a tree. And the other one's, yeah, you, you've heard it, right? They're all describing the elephant, but they're touching different parts of the elephant. And because they're touching different parts of the elephant, they have a different description. Light is like that. Light has, as far as we know, two natures, a wave nature and a particle nature. And depending on what you're doing, depending on the experiment you're doing, you will see one nature or the other. And so we say it has both, and you just see one at a time. Now, 
I'm going to stop with this slide because this is going to transition us into quantum theory. This double slit experiment transitions us. And so we're going to move into quantum theory. And I've said this to a few people, but it's important to know modern physics messes with your mind. First, we have relativity. Relativity, we suddenly have to accept that time and distances are malleable. Depends on what reference frame you're in, what the correct time is between two events, or what the correct length of an object is. Very mind-bending. The math wasn't that hard. The concept's really hard. Then we have the photoelectric effect, which leads us to the wave-particle duality, where we have to accept, we have to, that it has both natures. Now, my brain says we must not understand it well enough. If we understood it well enough, we wouldn't have this confusion. But with our current understanding, we say it's both of these. And now we have quantum mechanics, which really messes with your mind. So famous quote by Niels Bohr, the person who came up with Bohr's quantum condition in creating the first quantum model for an atom. He said, anyone who has not been shocked by quantum mechanics has not understood it. Right? If you understand it, it really is mind-blowing. Yeah, there are some people who say, sure, I can take it. <laughs> Will Smith's kids. We're talking about how you know quantum mechanics is so beautiful and stuff. And Niels Bohr's quote would definitely apply to them. <laughs> you simply can't understand it if you're saying these things about it. Richard Feynman, I'm going to tell you what nature behaves like. And if you'll simply admit that maybe she does behave like this, you will find her a delightful, entrancing thing. It's a, it's a positive, uplifting thing instead of a more negative like Bohr. But quantum mechanics is very bizarre. We're going to learn... That, that nature is nothing like what we see in our daily lives. So that's what we will study next lecture. All right. Have yourself a great day. Bye.